Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. I want to remind you that today is the first Sunday where masks are optional, and you can choose to wear them at your discretion. I also want to remind you that we will no longer be doing registrations for first or second or third service as we are ending our safe spacing. If you prefer to have still a safe space seating, you can register for our third service at 12 p.m. and we will have a special section designated for people who prefer to keep their distance. Now join us as Bishop Collins continues his series, Love, Passion, or a Promise, The Making of a Kingdom Man. Oh, praise God, hallelujah. Praise God, hallelujah. Praise God, hallelujah. This is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we give you glory. We honor you and we praise you this morning. God, we thank you that we're able to be here this morning. That we can lift up hands and praise you. That we can open our hearts and our ears to hear from you. So God, we just pray that you anoint the man of God as he preaches today. That you fill the sanctuary, oh God, with your spirit. That we would leave here better people that we came in. And in this, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. And God's people said amen. And, and amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? And some of you, mask free. Praise the Lord. Uh, let me say something. They say it's going to be a real hot summer. Oh, don't cheer that. <laughs> Because I said that to say this, I'm going to be dressed this way all summer. So if you think that I'm not anointed because I don't have a tie on, well, I'll be praying for you. But relax and enjoy the summer. Because how many of you understand that the power of God does not reside in how we're dressed outwardly, but how we're dressed on the inside? And he is in this place today. Bless his name. Ezekiel 22, 23 through 31. Ezekiel 22, 23 through 31. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the time of indignation. There is conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have de devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned in the midst of them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain, and her prophets have daubed them in untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way I have recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Before you are seated, I want you to listen to this. In the rural town of Cairo, Georgia, two brothers grew up on a farm. One brother took to education like a duck to water. He graduated from Georgia Tech and became a renowned engineer in Chicago. The other brother was content to stay on the farm. Some years later, the educated brother was invited to give a speech in Atlanta at the Peachtree Plaza Hotel. He had not seen his brother for such a long time, and so he invited his brother to bring his family to the hotel and spend some time with him. That rural farmer brother had never been in a town bigger than Cairo. He and his wife and his son piled in their pickup truck and they headed for Atlanta. The very act of driving on the interstate highway was a fearful experience, but they made it. 
They pulled into the front of the Peachtree Plaza. The farmer left his wife in the truck. He and his son went in to check in, which also was a never-before experience for the farmer brother. Just inside the entrance were a number of elevators. That man, that farmer, had never seen an elevator before. He watched as a large, plain, middle-aged lady stepped inside one of those little rooms. The door closed, and after about a minute, the doors opened, and out stepped a young lady who was a vision of loveliness. That farmer's eyes bugged out. Quickly, he punched his son and said, Boy, go get your ma. I'm going to run her through that thing at least one time. <laughs> as we wrap up this lesson on making of a kingdom man this day, let me remind us of three things. They're necessary. Number one, we need kingdom men because there is a dearth, a famine, a fatherly influence in the lives of men in our nation. Number two, there is a dearth of understanding what constitutes a man. And as you're seated, I want to talk a little bit more about the third one, and then I'm going to conclude this, seat, this, this message. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The third reason that we need kingdom men is that there is a dearth of understanding the power of influence of kingdom men. And because we have all three of these, we have created for ourselves a society of immoral men who produce more and more weak and immoral sons. And I repeat, we are in such deep weeds in this nation because the last few generations of men as a whole have not been reflecting the image of Christ to our little children, but in fact infecting the children with a corrupt legacy. And again, God says that corrupt fathers create a society, a legacy of corruption that is generational. And let me tell you what I learned about us. We like to play the blame game in, it, in this nation when it comes to the mess we're in. And so stay with me just for a few moments. On April 20, 1999, the senseless slaughter of Col at Columbine High School occurred. Thirteen young hopeful teenagers died in the mass shootings. According to NPR.com, there have been, on average, listen to this church, 10 mass shootings in the United States each week this year of 2021. But Columbine was the one that really started and sparked a considerable debate in society. Human nature being what it is, we did back then what we are doing even more so now. We're desperately trying to blame someone or something for these senseless acts that have been committed by fellow human beings. How many mass shootings have we heard about in the last few weeks? Listen to me now. Because it's easier to deal with these situations when we can firmly and decisively blame someone else, even if that blame is undeserved. You see, the mantra has not changed. Some are blaming the existence of firearms in our society, arguing that guns should be outlawed, thereby preventing future acts of violence because we refuse to understand that guns don't kill, people do. In Columbine case, Others even blamed the assailants' parents for not noticing their hobbies of sawing off shotgun barrels and building bombs. Still others blamed the game Doom, which they say trained the two young men to become cold-blooded killers. When you look at the situation and America's reaction to it, what you need to see is this, and let me illustrate it this way. I want you to get a picture this morning of a farmer who was standing in a field, a field of ripe, mature so soybeans ready for harvest. The farmer is angry and he is frustrated because he doesn't want soybeans in his field. He wants cotton. Cotton prices are high. Soybeans are low. And so he's standing in the middle of this bean field. He's yelling and fussing and jumping up and down. And he's cussing those soybean plants and trying to convince them to become cotton plants. Though my brother-in-law is a dairy farmer, he will tell you that that is ridiculous. Watch this now. Our farmer has a field of full soybean plants because he planted them there if he wanted cotton he should have done what planted cotton but in the spring when he planted the field he thought soybeans were a better crop now listen to me he is going to harvest soybeans no matter how much he wants the field to be filled with cotton it is as the apostle paul told the galatians in galatians 6 and 7 a man reaps what he sows now if you don't know it yet i'm trying to tell us something today 
blame whomever you will, but there is an underlying truth that we don't want to talk about in this nation. And this truth is crying out to be heard as it lays crucified, not only in the streets of America, but in many of the halls and the sanctuaries of our churches. And it is this truth that is harvest time in America. America is indeed reaping what we have sown. Have sown. We want cotton when we have planted soybeans. Hosea 8 and 7 says, they have sown to the wind and thus reaped a whirlwind. We are still sowing to the wind in this nation without any reservation or any conviction. Let me talk to you just for a moment. In this country, we have raised a generation of children who have been mentored by the one-eyed babysitter called a television, video games, and computer computers, among other things, whose role models are fantasy characters and daycare workers whose weary mothers and fathers have pursued success as defined by our society only to find its promise of satisfaction hollow and empty. Listen to me now, church. We have abandoned the barbaric, archaic archaic concept of discipline in the name of building self-esteem because you know our kids psyche is so fragile these days we wouldn't want to knock them over into irreversible depression we have educated our children in schools where prayer even voluntary prayer is forbidden and the very mention of the reality of God can cause a good teacher's career to come to an abrupt halt removing anything Watch now, we have taught our children that there are no absolutes, removing anything resembling a solid foundation for living, and taught them to seek their own reality when in this time in their development, they don't even know what reality looks like. We have devalued human life by making it easy and legal for a girl to kill her unborn baby for the sake of convenience. We have bombarded our children with the images of violence and bloodshed and stripped them of the joy and the innocence of their childhood by making images and situations and dialogue that would have once been considered pornographic. I turn on my TV and I see that we have made it now standard fare on prime time network TV. I'm trying to tell us something. For then like the farmer in the soybean field, we wonder why our children have turned out so warped and twisted and confused. We wonder where in the world they got their values or the lack thereof. And in a true exercise of denial, listen to me, for this is the reality of our nation. We look for someone to blame or something that we can blame for the things that they have done when the truth of the matter is that we are reaping the wind of the seeds that we have planted. Are there answers to the dilemma? Yes, there are. There is hope in the middle of unbelievable chaos. And we know that it begins with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name should humble themselves and pray, and they shall seek my face and turn from wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That is first and foremost the church. Everybody save the church. First and foremost, the church, we have got to humble ourselves once again under the mighty hand of God. And we've got to learn to pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. But right on the heels of that, listen to me, especially men in this room and ladies, you encourage them. There must come an uprising of kingdom men who will declare that we're no longer going to allow the school system to be the voice in our children's ears. Where so many of them are poisoning their minds with lies about God and sexuality and taking away your parental rights. There must be an uprising of kingdom men who no longer continue to make babies while not understanding, as former President Obama said, that responsibility for fathers does not end at conception. Who understand that what makes you a man is not the ability to have and create a child. It's the courage to raise one. And so we understand that kingdom men are, number one, courageous. Number two, kingdom men are men of conviction. Number three, kingdom men are men of composure. Number four, kingdom men are men of certitude. Number five, kingdom men are men of capacity. Now let's look at number six. Kingdom men are men of chivalry. They are courteous, generous behavior. They are of courteous, 
generous behavior. Now, I know I touched on this in another part of the series, but it needs to be touched on again because I want us to understand that we have not taught our generations of men how to behave as gentlemen. I have been with my family in the mall and even in some churches, and I've turned to my daughters, and they'll tell you I have said this to them. As I've observed some young men today, I have said to them, don't bring a fool like that home to meet me. Don't ever date someone who will not show you courtesy and generosity. The other day, Lady Brenda and I went into Kelly's, and we, we drive in, and we're in the parking lot, and we're waiting to go through the drive through and we look over, and this big truck pulls in, and this guy jumps out with this long ponytail, and I'm looking at him, and he opens the door for his girlfriend, and first of all, I had to revive myself because he opened the door. Then they come back out, and they get in the car, and he walks over, and he opens the door again. Lady Brenda pulls out smelling salts because now I'm out. I can't believe what I just saw because it's so rare to see a young man act like a gentleman that every time I see it, I get excited. And I am amazed at how many young men think that Jessica and Shauna's daddy is hard. I'm not hard. I'm wise. And any father with any ounce of love for his daughters wants them to date young men who will respect them. It's not that I'm hard. It's that so many young men today no longer know how a man of God should operate in relationship with the opposite sex. And I'm not just talking about sex. I'm talking about respect and honor and treating a woman as a precious jewel. Because listen to me, it is not just in the malls, it is in our churches. There are selfish, self-centered men. It's all about them and their needs. With that, a woman might as well have married a non-Christian. Lady Brenda and I know a young lady who was married to a preacher. And married to that preacher, he treated her so badly they ended up divorced. And then finally she ended up marrying a non-Christian. And she made this statement. She said, you know something? My non-Christian husband treats me the way a man of God ought to treat me. I said, good for her, but I, what a sad commentary on the men of the kingdom of God. There's a commercial, a lady is in, in a Home Depot type store. She needs to pick up a bag of cement and there's this guy standing over in this area and he's looking at his phone and then he looks at her and there's he's standing in this area. He gives her that look, don't you look at me, I ain't going to help you lift that bag and then he reengages his phone. That is the sad state of many men today. Listen to me very closely. 1 Peter 3 and 7 says, likewise, 1 Peter 3 and 7, likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. What is the knowledge? Giving honor unto the wife, putting her needs before your own. But even deeper, it goes on to say, giving deference to her as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Now, why does it say that? Listen now, that your prayers might not be hindered. Some of you men need to listen to me because you're praying and you're putting nothing is happening when you pray because you are putting your needs, your wants, your desires before your wife's. And then you're trying to get answers to your prayers when God says, if you don't treat your wife right, you hinder your prayers. How? You see, Christ is in total alignment with God. And when your relationship with your wife is out of alignment, listen now, because this truth works in every relationship, alignment is always better than assignment. Just listen to me. Just as you need to be in alignment with the ministry of a church to have the blessing of the favor that's on that ministry on your life, so it is with your marriage and family. It must be aligned with God's word. And God's word says to love your wife as Christ loves the church. Lay your stuff down. Lay yourself down. Your wants down. Your needs. Your everything. Listen to me. Your desires. Because if you don't lay it down for her, there's going to be friction and division. And when you pray your prayers are going to be hindered because you're out of alignment first timothy 3 1 through 7 the king james version listen very very closely men this is a true saying if a man desires the office of a bishop let me just stop and say there for all you people who think the bishop's not in the bible i just found him <laughs> he desires a good work 
A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God, not a novice, a baby Christian, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Then the Bible goes on to say that if you want to be a deacon, you need to have these same things in your life. But let me tell you what it's really saying. If you are a kingdom man, then these same things apply to your life. I was reading this article by Sophie Martin. It's called 23 Acts of Chivalry <laughs> that men need to bring back. I promise you I won't read all 23. She said, number one, holding the door for people, especially when they are carrying heavy things that are not, and they are not as physically fit as you are. Amen. Number two, getting to know her parents. Oh, there's a novel thought. And actually taking time to earn their trust and approval. She said, some people think that asking permission for, pro for proposing is outdated. I still believe in it. I called up my father-in-law and said, can I marry your daughter? He said, no, but I said, but the Holy Ghost is upon me, so yes. <laughs> He finally came around, and Lady Brenda and I, we kept moving our wedding time because I really wanted his approval, and I got it. Number three, walking women to the door after a date and not expecting that she's going to sleep with you just because you came within 10 feet of her door. She said, number four, number four when the waiter comes asking her what she'd like and letting her order first. Let me tell you something. Whenever I go into a restaurant, I have to teach most waiters etiquette. I have to teach them. They walk right over to me, and they go, what would you like to order, sir? I said, will you take the lady's order first? I had staff in the past. We'd go into a restaurant, and the guys would sit there, whip out their, mem their, 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 their little, uh, whatchamacallit, you know that thing, what do they call that thing, the menu. And they would open it up, and they'd be getting ready to order. I said, stop. Let the ladies order first. Men have got to learn to be men. She says this, standing up for her, she has spoken too aggressively. She made this statement telling her you love her with no expectations just because it's true. And then she says this, and it's very powerful, not looking at these things in terms of old-fashioned, but realizing that making your partner feel good is something timeless. She said these little things don't need to change because we're in the 21st century. Because let's face it, there are some things that our parents and grandparents just did better than us. I have a secular magazine called Men's Health. I don't read most of the articles because they make me blush. And when you see a black man blush, that's blushing. <laughs> Listen to me now. The article by Sable Young says chivalry ain't dead, at least not totally. She said this, chivalry, chivalry after all is a code of conduct. It's not about what you think someone deserves, but rather how you choose to conduct yourself. And here is the interesting part about what I just shared with you. The young women who shared this do not claim to be Christians. I said that to say this. Jesus said in Luke 16 and 8, sometimes the people of the worldly kingdom, they are more wisely behaved than children of the kingdom of light than Christians. I said that to say this. Number one, ladies, understand something. That you need to understand that what you tolerate, you perpetuate. The second thing I say is, men of God, how dare we let worldly people behave better than we behave? Number seven, kingdom men are men of consistency. It is the word reliability. Consistency, that means reliability. Matthew 5, 37, all you need say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. 1 Corinthians 10, 21, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. What we're talking about here, men of God, is the reality that you cannot walk one way in life while talking another way about life. There is a plaque that says, your talk talks, but your walk talks more than your talk talks. Another saying is, I can't hear what you're saying because what you're doing is so loud. I ask you, kingdom men, in a day where lying is a lifestyle for many. Yes, it is. I'm amazed at how many Christians will sit in my office and lie like a rug. And they get up and walk out and I go, liar, liar, pants on fire. 
in a, a time where making promises and breaking them is as common as breathing. Where so many can no longer be counted on and be counted on. I want to ask you men of God, can you? And where so many talk Christianity while betraying the very essence of a relationship led by Christ. What about you? John McIntyre did a poll and when asked which traits society values most in men. Honesty and morality, 33%. Professional or financial success, 23%. Ambition or leadership, 19%. Strength of toughness, 19%. And good work ethic, 18%. Are you understanding that our society values honesty and morality consistently? Who you say you are, that's what we honor. And I'm going to ask you a question. Are you who you say you are, man of God? Can people count on you? Can your family count on you to be consistent? Let me tell you why so many so-called Christian men have trouble with honesty and morality. There was a poll that was done that found that American men are among the world's most pagan in the known universe. What does it mean to be pagan? It means to be worshipers of other things other than God. But Bishop, I don't worship other things. Let me tell you something. Maybe you do. Because let me help you understand something. That paganism is putting anything and making it a God before Almighty God. It's called idolatry. Do you have any idols, men? Your job, your business, Your money, your car, your home, your gifting, your family. Idolatry is really what Romans 1 is really about. It's not really about homosexuality. Romans 1.25 is really about this. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. That is really what idolatry is. It is worshiping things that are man-made that God has given them the ability to create rather than worshiping the creator who alone is worthy to be praised. A study years back found that the church has little or no influence on American men. Do you understand, though, that one of every three American men claim to be born again, but only 28% attend church on any given weekend? Listen to me. And you cannot be consistent in your walk with God unless you consistently walk with God. And I don't care what the world tells you. I don't care what flaky Christians tell you. You cannot have a consistent walk with God when you inconsistently obey his word to come regularly to his house. If you are watching me on this stream, you need to understand that the masks are gone. I'm trying to help somebody. And I've been praying and begging God, God, awaken us from our apathy. Spiritual apathy, wake us up, all of us. May COVID have served its purpose to remind us that God is still on the throne. Do you know that they did a study and they found out that children who their fathers were consistent in church attendance, when they became adults, most of them stayed in church because of the consistency of the father bringing them to church. Number eight. Kingdom men are men of clout. What do I mean? You have influence. Now, everybody has influence. I'm talking about kingdom men. We influence forward, not in reverse. Proverbs 27 and 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Proverbs 13 and 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Let me give a thought or two, and then I'll move on. I want you to take a deep look at who are the greater voices in your life. Who are you giving greater access to when it comes to your mind? Who are the voices that you allow to speak consistently, men, into your life? One more time, you show me who you keep company with, and I will show you you. I don't care what you say. I will show you you. Watch now. And I don't care what excuse you come up with for bad company or for immature company. Who you hang with and listen to tells me all I need to know about you. You wonder, where did that come from? I didn't used to think like that. Well, let me ask you a question. You hang out with liars? Well. You hang out with thieves? Well. You hang out with con men? Well. You hang out with deceivers? Well. You hang out with those who compromise the word of God? No conviction. Everybody say, well. 
Now, if I was in the black church growing up, when I was growing up, they would have hit that point and went, well. <laughs> Let me give you another thought. Sometimes people are not bad people. They're just the wrong people for you to be constantly keeping company with men. Let me tell you a truth in life. Water seeks its own level. You will only go as high as the level of the relationships that you attend to. Am I saying you can't have friendship with people at a variety of levels in life? Absolutely not. But what I am saying is this. is not every person you speak to or allows to speak to you should have authority to speak in certain areas of your life. If you're a married person, what are you talking to a single person about when you got problems in your marriage? Just trying to help somebody. You want to be wise. Hang out with and listen to the wise. And I didn't say those that you agree with. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the people you disagree with have more wisdom than you think. You just don't recognize it at the moment. But Some people who have gone where you're trying to go, been where you are right now. Listen to me. When I have a dilemma, I don't call up pastors who've been pastoring for three years. I call pastors who've been pastoring for 30 years. Your life is not only the sum total of how you think, but much of that thinking has to do with those you allow the greatest influence into your mind by way of your ear. Please remember this all the days of your life. Deep calls to deep and shallow calls to shallow. I always tell pastoral staff, don't talk about what you would do when you were in charge because you're on the other side of the desk and everything looks easier on the other side of the desk. And the truth of the matter is you don't know what you would do until you're sitting on the other side of the desk. And I always said when I was a youth pastor, I never ever said if I was the pastor, I'd do this or that. And I'm so glad because God has helped me because I really understood that it's a whole lot easier to be in charge when you're not in charge. And I tell my staff, you will never understand but that you sit on the other side of the desk. And here's the thing about most staff, they never will sit on the other side of the desk. So the safest thing for them is to put their trust in the years of the wisdom of the senior guy. It's not that I know everything, it's that I know more than you know. I finally had one pastor call me, he's now a senior pastor, and he called me up. And I just laughed, he said, Bishop... Now I know what you meant when you said about the other side of the desk. <laughs> he said, thank you for telling me that. Now here's the third thought. Never underestimate placing people on a pedestal. Listen to me. You need to honor me, but don't you put me on a pedestal where I can't maintain my balance. Because I'm human just like you. Eli Black was a brilliant businessman best known for two events in his life. Number one, he masterminded the multi-million dollar takeover of the United Fruit Conglomerate. Number two, he jumped to his death from the 42nd floor of the Pan Am building in New York City. In the book, an American company, an executive described a business lunch he had with Eli Black. When the waitress brought a plate of cheese and crackers as an appetizer, Black reached out and he took them and he placed them on the table, blocked them with his arm and continued talking. The executive hadn't eaten for hours, and he hinted that he would like a cracker. But Black acted as though he hadn't heard him, and he went on with the business meeting. After a while, Black placed a cracker and cheese on the tip of his fingers, and he continued to talk. Several moments later, Black placed that cracker on the executive's plate and then blocked the rest as before. It was clear that Black was in charge. He had the gift of manipulating others as he pleased. I said that to say this, people looked up to him, they wanted to be like him. There's nothing wrong with you wanting to be like certain people, men, but let me tell you something, when you play follow the leader, you better check to see who's in the front of the line. Eli Black, for all his power, ended up in suicide, could listen to me, men, Jesus Christ at the end of the day is who you need to follow. Paul's advice is true for every relationship, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. He said, follow me as long as I'm following Christ. 
Listen to me, men. That's why how each of us should live. We should only follow men as they follow Christ. And then secondly, we need to live in such a way so that we have the power and the ability and the right to say to other people, follow me as I follow Christ. Because number nine, and finally, kingdom men are men of character. I'm talking about ethics. 1 Samuel 16 and 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Here's why we have got to quit putting celebrities and making preachers out to be celebrities. We have got to stop looking at the outward appearance and start asking God to help us as he does not to look at the outward stuff, but enable us to look in and sense the heart and the spirit of the man. Listen now. Stop putting them on a pedestal because they are on TV, on radio. They got a popular stream. I'm going to say something that's very vital, and I hope everyone really hears this. The day of the celebrity preacher is rapidly being brought to an end. God is ripping the veil of the flesh and exposing our hearts. He's exposing why a man stands in the pulpit, what motivates him to preach. And I am convinced that God, by his grace, used this season of COVID for several reasons. And one of them was to separate many of the synthetic preachers from the authentic we saw a line of demarcation drawn between those who were sent and those who went, those who called themselves to the ministry. And my word today to every preacher and to every man, myself included, if you are going to be a kingdom man, please know that even as God is revealing the hearts of preachers, he will tear back the flesh of your heart, men, as well, because God's kingdom is at a place right now where he refuses to allow men who lack character. He wants men who will not compromise on his word for the sake of convenience and comfort and God is plucking back he's separating the wheat from the tares I read an article the other day that says what is ethics it was done by Santa Barbara or Santa Clara University it says ethics is based on well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do usually in terms of rights obligations benefits to society, fairness, and specific virtues. Some years ago, sociologist Raymond Baumhart asked business people, what does ethics mean to you? Listen to some of these responses. Ethics has to do with what my feelings tell me is right or wrong. Ethics has to do with my religious beliefs. Being ethical is doing what the law requires. Ethics consists of the standard of behavior our society accepts. I don't know what ethics means. Listen to me very closely. There is a problem with every one of those replies. But the last one sums it all up. For we live in a time in a society where there is proof everywhere you turn that most people don't know what having ethics mean and the ones who do, so many of them don't care. Let me tell you what ethics is not before I tell you what it is. Ethics is not something that is based on emotion or feelings. Ethics is not something that we do out of religious belief. Ethics is, is, is not doing what is right because you fear the law. Because how many of you understand that depending on who's in the White House, that laws deviate? Ethics is not something that consists of the standards of behavior our society accepts. Because anybody with half a brain and the other tied behind their back can see that ethics mean very little to many who make the laws in this country. Someone said an entire society can become ethically corrupt. Nazi Germany is a good example of a morally corrupt society. You can't go by what society is, accepts, church, because you can't even get so-called Christians to agree on what God says. Because we live in a day and age that says in the church, here is what God says. Now let me take it and twist it like a pretzel to fit my own theological preferences. Let me say this with all the love I can muster. We have a president and vice president whom I love and I pray for. We have men and women who sit on the seats of justice. We have a Congress full of people, of, a Congress of people, senators, governors, mayors, etc. We have people sitting in seats of authority, but very few operate through biblical ethics. 
And because of this, we have in the nation a Judges 21-25 issue, and it is this. In those days, Israel had no king, so everyone did what they saw fit. We have kicked the king of glory off of the throne in every way possible. We don't do what God says ethically in this country. We create our own form of ethics, and many times we call it social justice. Hear the Holy Spirit. What we do not have is a whole lot of people, listen to me, I didn't say all of them, but we have very few as a whole sitting in seats of authority who really understand the meaning of ethics. Because if they did, some of the things that are being brought into law that are contrary to the average normal mind, listen to me, they wouldn't be happening. Some of the things going on in this nation right now, you don't need to be a Christian to understand that they may be legal but not ethical. Listen to me for a moment. Please write this down. ChristianPost.com. ChristianPost.com. I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you to write this down. Because here's what I want you to do. When you get a chance, I want you to go online and look up this article. Parents furious at New York City private school over graphic sex ed videos shown to first graders. I want you to go online. I want you to pay attention. People pay $55,000 a year for this school and they showed first graders things and I saw part of the video that I would be embarrassed to show to grown people. And even though 60%, 62% of Americans, listen to me, I'm not talking about only Christians. Even though 62% of Americans oppose allowing boys who identify as female to compete in girls' sports, our government is trying to force it down our throats as doing the ethical thing. Because listen to me, ethics are not based on what man says nor what religion says. True ethics are built on what God says in his word. And listen to me, church. When biblical ethics prevail, a man doesn't need a watchdog. A man doesn't need someone looking over his shoulder to make sure he does the right thing. For that man lives as Paul instructed in Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more so in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Listen to me. You know what Paul says? He says, you don't just do what's right in front of my back you do what's right behind my back don't just show up of uh, uh, living righteously when I'm with you the proof of righteousness is how you operate and live when I'm not present living ethically when there is no one there to make sure that you do work out your salvation with fear and trembling let me talk to you for a moment walk out work out your salvation with fear and trembling your life how do you work it out not to please men but to because you seek to please almighty god work it out read on for it is God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. Hear this. The only way that any of us can live out the, and be driven by biblical ethics is to yield daily to the Holy Spirit and allow him to work in us. What's he going to work in us? A desire, a will, a to-do, the ability to carry out what brings him pleasure. Why do we do it? The rest of Philippians 2.19 says, and to act in order to fulfill God's good purpose. Hear the Holy Spirit. What's his good purpose? Verse 15. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Everybody say then. Watch what he says. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. That's where ethics come from. The word of life. No wonder the saints of old said, it's the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. 
I stand alone on the word of God. It's the B-I-B-L-E. Let me tell you about that book. God says if you want to please me, your ethics must be Bible driven. I'm going to say it again. Not religion. When you're Bible, when you are Bible driven, let me tell you something. He will keep you from falling. When you are Bible driven, he will keep you from stumbling. When you are Bible driven, he will keep you from bowing to the idols of this world. I'm going to say it again because some of you need to grab this Religion will not keep you from falling because a whole lot of people claim to be religious, but they are terribly void of ethics. Jerry Vines says that John 3.16 addresses a number of isms. <laughs> Let me share it with you. We all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Let me break it down like he does. The phrase for God responds to atheism which claims there is no God. The phrase so love responds to fatalism, which asserts that God is an impersonal force. The phrase the world responds to nationalism, which says God loves only one group of people. The phrase that he gave responds to materialism, which says it's more blessed to receive than to give. The phrase his only begotten son responds to Mohammedism, which says God has no son. The phrase that whosoever believes responds to five-point Calvinism, which says Christ died only for the elect. The phrase in him responds to pluralism, which says all religions are equal. Let me pause there for a moment. Karl Barth was lecturing at a group to a group of students at Princeton. One student asked the German theologian, Sir, do you think that God has revealed, don't you think that God has revealed himself in other religions and not only Christianity? The answers, listen, Barth's answer was the answer of answer, for he stunned the crowd when with modest thunder he answered, No, God has not revealed himself in any religion, including Christianity. He has revealed himself in his son. I said, Enough said. The phrase should not perish responds to annihilationism, which says there is no hell. The phrase, but, you, but have everlasting life, responds to what many who we believe are Armenianism. We're, that's what we believe, but we go too far with it sometimes, which sometimes teaches that it says that God only gives life conditionally. Let me tell you what I believe, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But the condition is not on God's giving. It's on our end. John 3.16 is simple, simple biblicalism which reveals the mind and the heart and the will of God. Here's what I'm driving at. If you want to know what it means and how to live ethically, it is in the book. You've got 66 books called the Bible that gives us guidance in every area of life. If you will quit acting like it's just another book for you to peruse at your convenience. Let me talk to you. And in it we find that which God says about and the need that we have to live by biblical ethics for Philippians 2 and 12, I read that to say this, we are living in a time where who and what we appear to be on Sunday morning in this house of worship must become who we really are the other six days of a week. I know we're not perfect. I know we're going to fail sometimes, but for the kingdom's sake, men, we have got to start living what the word declares. And when we do so in earnest, God will look at our hearts. Oh, we wear out Dr. Martin Luther King's words, don't we? The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. See, that's easier to say than to do. Let me talk to us men. Where do you stand when there's a decision to be made that puts you between a rock and a hard place, even when you didn't create the rock and the hard place? Max Lucado tells of sitting in the car with a friend in front of his house as they talked about his friend's dilemma. The friend's chief client pulled out on him, leaving him big bills and few solutions. What the client did wasn't right, but he did it anyway. The client's company was big and Max's friend's company was small and there was not a lot he could do. His friend was left, as he described it, with a den of hungry lions wanting six figures worth of satisfaction. The friend said, I called my uncle and I told him what happened and I told him I was thinking of filing bank bankruptcy. Max asked him, well, what did he say? And the friend responded, he didn't say anything. Then the friend said this. He says, after my uncle was silent for a long time, he said, I answered it for him. He said, I said to my uncle, we don't do that, do we? And the uncle said, no, we don't. So the friend said, I'll pay my bills. 
If I have to sell my house, I'll pay my bills. That kingdom men is the picture of biblical ethics. Let me tell you something. The law says that he had a legal right to file bankruptcy. But in his mind, he said, but that's not ethical. Max said this. He says, I was encouraged. Somebody still believed that if he did what was right, God would do what was best. Let me tell you what I have not only experienced, but I've seen time and time again. Every time I have done what was right, God did what was best. Max said, there was still some we don't do it like that faith in the world and the sky began to clear. Men, how will we live as men of character governed by biblical ethics? We have to change the way we think. We've got to start living, not just quoting Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Philippians 4, 8 through 9, finally. You know what finally means? There's no other answer. This is it. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever it is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things, whatever you have learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. We don't do what is ethical on the watchdog mentality. Only doing what is right when someone is looking over our shoulder. That's not ethics. Listen to me, and we don't do what is biblically un un unethical because the law says you have a right to do something. And they call it ethical by worldly standards. Let me just illustrate it this way, men. Men have a legal right to go to Vegas and gamble away their family's future. But the question is, to every kingdom man, is what I'm doing ethical? In a world of ethically cloudy dark and darkness, God raised up kingdom men of courage, conviction. Listen now. Composure, certitude, capacity, chivalry, consistency, clout, and character. Because here's the conclusion of the matter. Number one, to become a kingdom man, you must begin to possess the promise. Ezekiel 37, 4 through 5, Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the words of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. Dr. Evan tells, to Evans tells us in his book that, number one, the truth of God's word will give life to our dry bones. Oh, God, pour out your spirit on men. Number two, God will give us power of his spirit. The second thing is this. The question is, how badly do you want it? Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Psalm 37 and 4, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Let me close with this. John D. Rockefeller was the very first person to reach the status of billionaire. He was a man who knew how to set goals and to follow through. At the age of 23, he became a millionaire. By the age of 50, a billionaire. Every decision, attitude, and relationship was tailored to create power and wealth. But about three years later, at the age of 53, he became very ill. His entire body became racked with pain, and he lost all the hair on his head. In complete agony, the world's only billionaire could buy anything he wanted, but he could only digest crackers. An associate wrote these words. He could not sleep, would not smile, and nothing in life meant anything to him. His personal, highly skilled physicians predicted he would die within a year. That year passed agonizingly slow. As he approached death, he awoke one morning with the vague remembrance of a dream. He could barely recall the dream, but he knew it had something to do with him not being able to take any successes with him into the next world. He was left with a choice. He called his attorneys, accountants, and managers, and he announced that he wanted to channel his assets to hospitals, research, and mission work. Listen now, men. On that day, John D. Rockefeller established his foundation. This new direction eventually led to the discovery of penicillin, cures for current strains of malaria, tuberculosis, and diphtheria. The list of discoveries resulting from one right choice are enormous. But I don't want you to miss this. For the most amazing part of Rockefeller's story is quite possibly the reality. Watch now that the moment he began to give back a portion of all he had earned, his body chemistry was 
altered so significantly that he got better. It looked like he would die at 53, but he lived to be 98. Ah, I said that to say this. Rockefeller learned gratitude and gave back his wealth. Doing so made him whole. Listen to me, men. It is one thing to be healed. It's another one to be made whole. And I said that to say this. God wants to make every man whole so that you might be as a kingdom man, whole and lacking nothing. Let me tell you about whole men. They lack absolutely nothing. And when you and I are whole... God will no longer have to search for men to stand in the gap because, as Dr. Evans says, when a kingdom man lives according to his design purpose, he joins with other men in influencing culture, politics, entertainment, and more through the process of intentional discipleship. This process becomes cyclical, leading to multi-generational impact because what we need today are kingdom men who are willing to invest not only in their own personal growth and opportunities, but also others. We need men who are willing to sacrifice the time and effort necessary to prioritize the unleashing of someone else's potential. If God's kingdom men decide to rise up and fulfill our calling, we can see him heal our hearts, our families, our churches, and our land. Give God glory. Oh, give him glory. Give him glory. Give him glory. I don't know about you, church, but I am excited because we're coming back. Amen. We're coming back. But here's what I see. Here's what I see. Bishop said it. God does not want us to come back the way we were. And I believe there's a greater challenge for the regathered church, the reassembled church. Oh, my God. <laughs> If God didn't want to do something with his church, he would have never had us scattered. He would have never kept us home. We would have just pressed on. But he allowed it to happen. And God always has purpose. And I believe that the purpose is that God wants us to come back with a new mindset, with a new way of thinking about how we serve him. So, saints, it's, it's time for tithes and offering. Put your hands together for that. It's part of our service. It's one of the ways that we serve him. So I was thinking, and I remember the scripture where the disciples asked Jesus, they said, um, Master, what, what is the greatest commandment? And, he, and, and Jesus said to them, it's to, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the greatest act of love in human history has already happened. His name is Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. God already did it. And that's the gospel. That God gave up the glory of heaven and came down. Suffered death and humiliation on a cross. Died, went in a grave and rose again. That our relationship with God might be restored. And that we might have the promise of heaven. But then when Jesus left, he gave us an assignment. And that was to continue to spread the gospel. And, and our special offering this week is for missions. And I want you to see something with me. Because although we, 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 support, we support missionaries around the world, your money, the money that you give up for the kingdom, helps to dig wells where children drink fresh water that won't kill them. It helps to supply, amen, it helps to supply bags of rice so children won't starve to death. Jesus said, love your neighbor as, you, as yourself. That's love. So as you consider, as we come back, reassemble church, as we come back, consider your mission giving. Consider how your mission offering says, I'm loving my neighbor down the street and on the other side of the world. There are many ways that you, you can give. You can give online or you can text your giving. You can 
make out a check and put it in the envelope. Pastor Lopez says, now don't rob Peter to pay Paul. Or, Amen. Don't take from your tithes. <laughs> I'm talking about offering when I talk about the mission. Amen. The tithe is, is what, we, what we owe God at a minimum. And then the offering is what we give above. I want you, church, if you would, as we come back, let's look at our giving differently. It's not just something that the church does to raise money, but I know that it's how God raises Christians and advances the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory. We honor you and we praise you, God. Thank you, God. Jesus, thank you that we can even be here today, God. Everybody didn't make it through the pandemic, but you saw fit in your grace that we're here coming back and ready to serve you with a greater fervency and a new mindset. So, Lord, take this offering. Take it, God, and use it like you did with two fish and five barley loaves. Increase it and direct it that many might be saved, many might be fed. Thank you for trusting us. In the name of Jesus. And God's people said amen. 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 We were going to sing with you a different song. But as I was listening to this song being played, it went into my spirit that, as Dr. Hill was sharing, that everything we go through as Christians, I believe, it demands a response. Not a reaction, a response. And here's what I mean by a response. We can choose to let the difficulties bring us down to the pit. Or we can choose to let them take us to a higher place of praise. Let me say something as, in a moment as I ask you to stand with us and we sing this song. But I want to say something to the two of you. I'm so glad you're sitting in front of me today. Because you're in our hearts. And God wants to tell you, be totally at peace. Everything is settled. Everything is settled. See, I know personally, Lady Brenda knows personally, some of us know what you've been through. But God wants you to know today, you're through. You're through. And I don't think that it's by accident that you're sitting directly in front of me because I've held on to this for a long time. Now all you've got to do as a couple, as a family, just rest in him and be at peace. Stand with me, church. Whatever you're going through, understand that Zion is calling to the higher place of praise. To stand up on the mountain and magnify his name. To tell all the people in every nation that he reigns. I know that Zion is calling me to the high. Would you lift your hands and say, and I know that Zion, Zion is, calling is calling me to, to the high place of praise. To stand up on the To tell all the people in every nation, nation that he reigns. I know that Zion is calling me to a higher place. Say it becomes, yeah, it becomes my. response to 
him would you give him glory just for a moment just give it to him thank you Jesus just give him glory just give him glory hallelujah and I don't care what your circumstance looks like the king of glory is above every circumstance every situation in life and Jesus says, if you even have little faith, speak to the mountain and it's got to move. You know why Jesus could say that? Because he says the Father has given him all power and authority. And because he has all power and authority, he says, when you news my name, it's got to bow. Mm, bow to the name. Bow to the name, bow to the name of the Lord. Tell your problem, you got to bow to the name, bow to the name, oh, bow to the name. Can you say it, Jessica? Can you say it? to the name yes 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 say bow to the name go on and tell your situation bow your circumstance because that's all it is when it comes up to the name of, of the Jesus Lord. there you go mm -hmm. it's say it. yeah bow to the name yes bow to the name go oh, bow down bow. everybody to say it now Come on, every, every man, every woman of God. Oh, let them say it's got to bow down. Bow to the name. Tell your problem to bow down. Bow to the name. Today it's got to bow.
say bow to the Oh, bow. Does anybody feel their help coming right now? Do you feel your help on the way right now? Say bow to the name. Bow down, bow down. Bow to the name. Oh, you gotta bow. One more time. Now sing it with authority. Sing it with anointing, with power. Say bow to the name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bow to the name. You gotta bow down. Bow to the name of the Lord. You gotta bow to the name. Say it, y'all bow down. above every name, the king of glory. Every trial's got to bow down. Tell your trouble of tomorrow. You got to bow down. Yeah, yeah. Say it, say it, say it. Yeah. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. Give God glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been a pleasure and a joy to worship with you once again. I want to remind you that we are no longer doing registration for services, so you can attend freely for one of three services at 8.30, 10.15, or 12 p.m. next Sunday. We do also have the option that if you prefer to keep the safe spacing, to register for a reserved seat in our 12 p.m. service only. I also want to remind you that we are relaunching our ministries, and kids and youth will be coming back on Sunday, July 4th. Keep updated on our Facebook and our Instagram pages so you know everything that is changing as we proceed through these restrictions. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday.